same month that 100,000 people died in Hiroshima, the first audiences were queuing to see a controversial new play by J.B. Priestley, An Inspector Calls. J.B. Priestley is now often handed down to us historically as a sort of rather genial pipe-smoking um, traditionalist, whereas in fact in a lot of his work he was a, very much a radical. A lot of the theatre work is, for its time, incredibly extraordinary and experimental. And a lot of his writings and original prefaces to the play talk about a dream landscape. Now, an extraordinary production of the play is taking modern audiences by storm. It's a bit like a great old masterpiece. What one's trying to do to a play like this is take away a lot of the grime and the dirt that have accumulated over the years and try to see the sharp, bright colours um, underneath. Some people say war is inevitable. To that I say... Fiddlesticks! Nobody <laughs> wants war except some half-civilised folks in the Balkans. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> to understand an Inspector Coles, we need to look at two periods of British history. 1912, when the play is set, and 1945, when the play was written. 40 or 45, we'll be living in a world that forgot all this capital versus labour agitations. Not all these silly little war scares. There'll be peace, prosperity, and rapid progress everywhere. <laughs> 1945 was the last year of the Second World War. During the war, Priestley had become well known to the British public through his morale-boosting radio broadcast that followed the BBC News every Sunday night. And I asked myself earnestly, if the kindness of Britain is overshadowed by that vast dark face, then we all might as well decide to leave this world, for it will not be a world worth living in. He felt that his writing was something he did uh, in order to, to forward the war effort. But more than that, um, it was to try and ensure that the life after the war was better than it had been before. He was echoing the feelings of ordinary people, that there was generally a, a feeling of the need for change. When the homeland is in danger and there's trouble in the air, we forget our little squabbles and its trespasses beware. All the nation is united when the danger looms in sight, and we march along together as we sing with all our might. United we shall stand, whatever may befall, the richest in the land, the poorest of us all, we must all sing together. altered the social face of Britain in many ways. The need for arms created full employment and the morale and welfare of the workers became a national priority. The evacuation of children mixed classes together and for the first time showed people how the other half lived. The classes were also mixed together in the armed forces. Uniforms and clothes rationing meant everybody looked the same. People were given a vision of how a truly socialist Britain might be. If Britain could survive. Now they're going into the public shelters. This is not a pleasant way to spend the night, but the people accept it as their part in the defence of London. did survive, the war was over. But what should Britain do now? Priestley caught the mood in his famous radio broadcast, Journey into Daylight. We lived at last in a community with a noble common purpose. We had a glimpse then of what life might be if men and women freely dedicated themselves not to their appetites and prejudices, their vanities and fears, but to some great communal task. Immediately after the war, there was a general election. Winston Churchill, the hero of the war, expected to win, but he underestimated the desperate need for change in the war-battered population. People wanted a new Britain. The Labour candidate, Clement Attlee, won a landslide victory and moved into number 10. Yes, sir. An inspector's called. 
Does he want to see me? Yes, sir. Says it's important. Oh, all right, then. Just show him in here. Give us some more light. Priestley set his play in 1912 because that era represented the very opposite of what people were hoping for in 1945. Two hours ago, a young woman died in the infirmary. She was ten there this afternoon because she'd swallowed a lot of strong disinfectant. Burnt her inside out, of course. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was in great agony. They did everything they could for the infirmary, but she died. Suicide, of course. Yes, yes, horrible business, but I don't understand why you've come here. The play is about do we return back to the values of an Edwardian era or do we move forward? The actual night that the play is set on is the night that the Titanic sunk, the great celebratory moment of the great dream which was about to collapse. I remember it quite clearly now. You're a lively, good looking girl. Country bred, I fancy. <laughs> Been working in one of my machine shops for over a year. Good worker, too. In fact, the foreman there told me he was ready to promote into what we call a leading operator, head of a small group of girls. But when they came back from their holidays that August, they're all rather restless. And they suddenly decided to ask for more money. Well, they're averaging 22 and 6 a week, which is neither more nor less than is paid generally in our industry. They wanted the rate raised, so they would average about 25 shillings a week. <laughs> Eight million people were living on incomes of less than 25 shillings. That's £1.25 a week. Millions were underhoused, underfed and under the thumb. Working women were at the bottom of the pile. Goods were churning out of the factories and we were so successful and we were successful because we kept as he says in the play the prices high but the wages were kept low so they all went out on strike didn't last long of course not if it was just after the holidays they'd be all broke if i know them quite right Gerald. they mostly were so was the strike after a few weeks pitiful affair mr burling's complacency was misplaced the labour force was on the move and finding its voice. On March the 1st, 1912, a million miners went on strike. At the time, the most complete industrial stoppage in British history. Gerald Croft is an aristocrat. The idea of labour strikes, the growth of the working class, is a, an appalling idea. I think he, he finds it completely outrageous that, uh, that there is such a, a movement existing. Britain was divided and ruled by class. The upper class, they owned most of Britain and earned most of the money. The working class, the Eva Smiths, paid the price. Eva Smith! She was one of them. She'd had a lot to say, far too much. So she had to go. You couldn't have done anything else. He could. He could have kept her on instead of throwing her out of... I call it tough luck. Rubbish! If you don't come down sharp on some of these people, they'd soon be asking for the earth. I should say so. They might, but after all, it's better to ask for the earth than to take it! Edna represents the underdog. She has to obey the Burlings. She has to agree with them. She must never question what they say or do, because they are her bread and butter. It's not easy to get a job, particularly at her age, and if she didn't get another job, it would be the workhouse. And the workhouse in those days was a desperate place. Some writers were concerned about the way people were living and the appalling social conditions at the time. But you three youngsters just remember what I tell you now. We can't let these Bernard Shaws and these H.G. Wells do all the talking! <laughs> For the vast majority, there was little education and little or no sanitation, no dole to fall back on and no national health service to rely on. 